Hey guys, today I'd like to talk to you about franchising. Franchising is typically seen as a quick and easy way of getting into business. No wonder it's so popular. You get to take advantage of a well-known brand name and a proven track record. You don't need to develop your own expertise. You tap into the experience and the expertise of the franchisor. And it usually entails significantly lower risk than starting something on your own. It works well for people who've already accumulated some capital, maybe a retirement fund or savings or an inheritance that they're looking to invest. Or people who want to go into business but don't have a very clear idea of a new product or service they'd like to provide. For today's lecture, I'd like to focus on what, what I consider to be the first step for anyone who wants to get into a business franchise. Selecting the right franchise opportunity, the right franchisor. Perhaps in future lectures, we'll get a chance to talk to you about how to expand the business, how to diversify your risk within the franchising format, or the secret to effective collaboration with your franchisor to get the most out of your investment. But for today, I'd like to focus on the most important step, the first step, choosing the right franchisor. Just for context and for full disclosure, I feel the need to share that aside from teaching at the Ateneo, I'm also a franchisee and entrepreneur, and my longest franchise relationship has been with Jollibee Foods Corporation. My presentation today is drawn from experiences I've had over the last 29 years, so my examples are skewed towards a fast food industry. But the principles I describe, the principles will be valid regardless of industry. Well, there are really just three key steps to finding the right franchisor. Know yourself, know the franchisor, look for the right fit. Sounds simple. Let me start with the third point, looking for the right fit. You need to look for that happy intersection between what you're looking for and what you can offer, and what the franchisor is looking for and what they can offer. Studies have shown that when franchisees are carefully selected, and I can share from my own experiences, franchise outlets are typically able to outperform company-owned outlets. Because they're able to take advantage of the entrepreneurial spirit and the personal attention of franchisees. This isn't present for company-owned outlets that are largely operated through a hierarchy of employees and managers. The importance of this malasakit is easily demonstrated through an everyday example. How often have you checked into a hotel and in the morning when you leave to go out sightseeing, you leave the air conditioner on? Because to your mind, I've already paid for the electricity. The electric bill isn't going to be added to my hotel bill. I leave it on all day so that when I come home, I come back to a well air conditioned and cold room. You're not going to do that in your own home where you're responsible for your electric bills. You're going to be turning everything off every chance you get. Before you go to school, before you go to work, you're going to turn off your air conditioners because you have to be responsible for your electric bills. Save for a franchising relationship. The malasakit is what makes franchise outlets perform better than company-owned outlets. A franchise relationship, like any other business relationship, can best be compared to a wedding. An essential ingredient for long-term success is the ability to find the right match. So let's go on to find out about knowing yourself, knowing your franchisor, and finding out who fits whom. Know yourself. What are you passionate about? What resources do you have access to? What do you want to get out of the franchising relationship? First, what are you passionate about? Don't invest in a business or industry that you're not interested in. Do you really want to spend your time working on something that holds absolutely no attraction for you? You want to wake up in the morning looking forward to the day ahead of you. Your lack of interest will eventually manifest itself in your business performance and your financial results. Believe in the product. If you wouldn't use the product, why would you expect others to do so? Know what you're passionate about 
and look for business opportunities in the area of your passion. Second point, what resources do you have access to? What do you bring to the table? The first and most obvious requirement would be funding or capital. And three terms I think you should understand. Franchise fee, total investment requirement, and royalty. A lot of people have asked me how much the franchise fee is for a Jollibee outlet. And when I say it's 1.2 million pesos, their usual reaction is, yan lang. Because they mistakenly thought that franchise fee means total investment. And that's just not the case. Franchise fee is an intangible asset. It's a one-time payment to the franchisor that gives you the right to open the store, gives you the right to cover a certain retail trade area. But that's different from the total investment requirement. Total investment requirement includes the franchise fee, but includes equipment, pre-operating costs, construction, etc., etc., etc. Third would be royalty. Royalty would be the percentage of daily sales that the franchisor will collect. So when you th think about the funds you have available, Make sure that you know which figures you're looking at, and you should have enough money to cover the total investment requirement. Second resource that you bring to the table could be expertise. Product or technical expertise, typically business and management expertise. Most franchisors are looking for someone who has a managerial capability to operate the outlet profitably and well. Access to a prime location. Usually, this is a compelling argument for a franchisor to award a franchisee to you. What if your ancestral home is in an area that has become highly commercial? You could monetize that asset by converting your home into a retail outlet and moving somewhere else where the land values are lower and the business environment is lower. The fourth resource I'd like to talk about is a network or contacts. Your network can be one of the most powerful resources you bring to the table. And let me give you my personal example. I've had the blessing of going to good high schools, a good college, and have made many friends in school. And remember I said one of the important resources you have to bring in is funds. Actually, in 1991, when I opened my first fast food outlet, I didn't have access to funds. What I had access to was a network, a network of contacts and friends. And what happened was I was able to go into franchising with a significant investment requirement, I might add, by tapping my networks and inviting good friends from high school and college to be investors in the business. So I had access to a location, access to a franchise relationship, to a business opportunity, but I didn't have capital. And I leveraged my network and contact of my network of friends and my contacts and invited them to invest in the business that I would run as an industrial partner. So there's no way for me to emphasize enough networks, contacts. And for those of you who are students today, develop those networks and contacts today. You don't know when that's going to be useful in the future. And I'm not saying be friends with people because they'll be useful in the future. But I'm saying your friends today can be your business partners of tomorrow. The fifth resource I'd like to talk about, something people sometimes overlook is time. How much time do you have to devote to this business? How much time and effort are you willing to put into running and operating this franchise outlet? As I've said earlier, one of the most important ways to make sure the franchise outlet works well and is profitable is your malasakit. Third point. What do you want out of the business? Most people say, it's obvious. Of course, what I want out of the business is profit. True. But needs can be very different. 
the need for profits can be very different. For someone who is retired and using his savings and retirement pay, they need security and an immediate stable source of income. A young person who's just out of school, willing to take more risks, can take a longer term view, has patient capital, less income today is okay in exchange for more income tomorrow. Potential growth and expansion opportunities, reinvestment opportunities are more important for a young person going to franchisee than someone who has retired and is looking at this as his retirement plan. The older person needs to look for a mature brand that might not be growing so much anymore, but has the potential to generate steady and reliable cash flows. Younger guy? more willing to invest in a newer brand with a lot more growth opportunity and reinvestment possibilities. How actively involved do you want to be? Some franchisors prefer that you step aside and let them run your store for you. Others want their franchisees to be actively engaged and hands-on in their involvement. Which kind of franchisee would you like to be? Second issue, so after you know yourself, know the franchisor. What is the business track record of the franchisor? What is their reputation? In a third and critical point that's over, often overlooked, what do you know of their values and their character? Track record. Well, if I look back on, over the, my years in the fast food industry, I can think of many brands. Casa Ilonga. Miggy's Super Tacos, Chopsticks, Chick Boy, Country Waffles. The older guys among you will remember these brands. Younger guys will say, Ano ba yan? I've never heard of those brands. But if you've never heard of them, there's a good reason why you haven't. They've all pulled out of the market with a lot of their franchises losing their entire investment. There's a variety of reasons why this happened from one brand to the other. Sometimes they overexpanded, did too much too fast. Sometimes the franchisor didn't have enough experience before they went into franchising. Sometimes they were used to operating a single outlet but were unable to support multi-site, multi-location operations. Sometimes the business model itself was bad or the product was only a fad. Sometimes they're unable to maintain food quality across multiple locations. Whatever the reason, franchises lost their shirts, investing in franchises that didn't have an established track record. Sometimes we see a brand growing rapidly, and we feel as if we have to jump in and join the bandwagon. Baka maubusan ng sites. And I would say, that's a crazy way to go into business, to just join the bandwagon, do your homework, know your franchisor, check their track record. How long have they been in business? How much experience do they already have? Do they have a reputation for consistency of product and service quality across multiple sites? Have they set up the necessary infrastructure to support large-scale, multi-site operations? How's their commissary set up? What's their management set up? How deep is their bench of leaders and managers? And how competent are they? Has the founder of the company transitioned from being an entrepreneur slash innovator to a manager? Second point about knowing your franchisor. What's their reputation? What do their existing franchisees say about the level of support they've received from the franchisor? What do their suppliers say about them? Other franchisees, suppliers, customers are good sources of information. One example I can give you, there was a brand that I became a franchisee of, and I noticed many of their suppliers were also franchisees. And I assumed that, hey, they spotted a good relationship, good opportunity, and from being suppliers, they transitioned into becoming franchisees. I didn't do my homework. I found out later, to my regret, 
It was because company X did not pay its suppliers that the suppliers became franchisees as the only way for them to collect from their franchisor. This should have rung alarm bells in the back of my mind had I only done enough background checking, had I invested the time and effort to know my franchisor. Underrated in business with the question of values. How good are the people behind the business? This is different from how good are they in business, right? How good are they in doing business is different from how good are they as people? How honest and ethical have they been in their personal as well as in their business dealings? How are they viewed in the business community? At the end of the day, after all the number crunching and all the business analysis, a lot boils down to this final question of character. To illustrate my point, let me share another story with you here. I call this story the franchisor from hell. I had a franchising relationship, and I'd been warned beforehand by other people, these guys don't have a great business reputation. But I was young then, and stupid, and attracted to the idea of all the profit I could make from that franchising relationship. Well, sa awa ng Diyos, we opened multiple outlets with this franchisor only to find that they thought the terms of the franchise agreement were optional. And they violated the franchise agreement, made us pay for things we weren't obliged to pay for, may increase our royalty rate just through a memo, despite the royalty rate being mandated in the franchise agreement. And in the end, they canceled my franchise on some flimsy excuse. And I, when I went to them and said, hey, why are you canceling my franchise over some very small thing? You know what they told me? They said, Madali lang yan, Rudy. We'll just issue you a new franchise agreement. But this time, the new franchise agreement included all the terms and conditions that weren't in the original franchise agreement. I've learned a very important and a very painful lesson from this experience with this franchisor from hell. After all the business dealings, after all the business management skills, the most important thing character. Contracts are only as good as the people who've signed them. If you need to rely on the franchise agreement to protect you from your franchisor, he's not the right franchisor for you. The point is, you enter into contracts only with people for whom contracts are unnecessary. Their handshake is good enough. And you might say, What's the point of the franchise agreement then? If you think the franchise agreement will protect you, it won't. Because our legal system is such that by the time you get recourse from the legal system, your business will have collapsed. The point of the franchise agreement, even people of goodwill can have varying recollections of what they have agreed to. The point of the contract, I feel, is to lay down clearly in writing what people of goodwill have agreed are the terms of engagement. It is not a document to protect you from an unscrupulous partner. It is a document that lays out the lay of the land and the rules of engagement. In closing, a franchise relationship is really like a wedding. You don't normally marry just anyone who comes along. The marriage can be heaven or hell, depending on what the two parties can make of it. Choose your business partner with the same care as you would a lifetime partner. Take your time. Wait for the right franchise business opportunity to come along. And remember these three steps. Know yourself, know the franchisor, Find out if there's a good fit. I can't emphasize enough the importance of character. Choose your partner well. Make sure you'll get what you need out of the franchise relationship before you enter it. Otherwise, why should you bother? Thank you, everyone, for your time. And I hope you picked up something from this lecture. Have a good day.